environmental topics are sometimes treated more like religion than science. Um, yet there's strong incentives to follow these norms. The bigger problem for science in this area is that following norms puts credibility at risk. But what about the impact of the paper? What about the impact of the research? So we can measure impact in different ways. One that's really important to, account, uh, to academics is citations. So one way in which the impact of your research is measured, it's an imperfect gauge, but it's how many other academics are citing your research. And that's tracked, um, so, people, so academics care about it. There, there could also be measures like media attention. Are you getting a bunch of attention on social media? Um, this is just a measure of academic citations here. And so some factors obviously matter, like the age of a paper. A paper that's been around longer has been cited more, right? So we control for these things in our assessments. We're trying to isolate the effect of the subjectivity score on future citations. And we find that they're positively related. Controlling for other things we think affect citations, more subjective papers are cited more. And that's especially true if they're about the environment. So subjectivity has the citation reward, especially about the environment. And, and, and so these estimates might look small, but you know, it's like a, if you double the degree of subjectivity it's associated with about a 10 percent increase in citations that's actually a larger increase than you get from doubling experience so more experienced academics get cited more but it's a lot easier for me to double my subjectivity the way i write than to double my experience right i have to wait a long time to double that so so i so i do think it's economically meaningful it's uh, statistically meaningful Okay, a couple other findings, and then I'll and then I'll move forward. Um, so we have a sample of these papers, and we know who the authors are. And so some economists cross over if you're working on the environment, especially, and they publish like I do. I do this. I publish in economics journals, and sometimes I publish in you know science and nature and proceedings in the National Cat. So so there's there's economists who cross over. And so one finding is if you look at a sample of just the same authors and just publishing in a different place, you find that economists are use more subjective language when they publish in non-economics journals. And that like, I mean, my personal experience with that is I've, I mean, in science journals, I have been pressured by referees and editors to say things that are stronger than I would choose to say in an economics journal and that I've rarely been pressured to do so in an economics journal. For example, I have a paper about uh, renewable energy and its potential for, um, uh, to, to help with uh, um, income growth in, in uh, rural communities. And one of the referees said, well, what you really need to do, you're understating this, what you really need to do is point out that the the survival of humanity depends on these results. The survival of humanity depends on this results because it's linked to climate change. So we're not going to say that. But there is pressure, and you know, the, I, I'm a I'm a full tenured professor. Um, I have more power to say no to some of these requests. But untenured young professors really need to get published, and you know, these science journals are very prominent. You have that on your CV. It's going to help you advance your career. A lot of people will say what they need to say to get published. So that's one, one finding. Um, another that resonates personally with me um, is this finding. So economists, there's economists that are really specialized and work in one field, and then there's economists that work across fields. So if you look at the set of economists that have published in both in 
on environmental topics in economics journals and on non-environmental topics, say just labor or finance or something like that, um, you see that they are no more subjective in the papers they write, even if they're about the environment. So what might that mean? Well, I think it means that economists that are specializing in writing on environmental topics are a different kind of self-selected group that are more willing to be subjective. And I see that a lot. I see that environmental economists, graduate students, people who write their statement of purpose and say they want to study environmental economics, it's often because they want to save the world and they're really concerned about the environment. And um, that's not a bad thing, but when those kind of personal objectives bleed into advocacy and show up in the journals, it's, it makes the science less objective. Um, I was like that. I wanted to study environmental econ uh, economics because I, you know, I, I thought the, you know, the environment's priceless, and I wanted to show that. And over time, I learned you don't get anywhere. You don't learn anything if you have that as your underlying advocacy position. Okay, so a few more comments, and some is to put my own research under the microscope. So I've I've been asking, well, is it is this just the the way it is? Like, we're, there's a lot of forces that say, well, we need better science communication. We need to communicate research to the public. And the public is not going to read these boring abstracts about super fun sites that are really objective. And so are we just doing what we have to do to get the word out? Is subjectivity necessary for attention? Is it necessary? This is the policy boot camp here that you're part of. Do we, do we need to talk this way to have an impact on policy? Um, so I considered two of my own research papers, and they're two papers that have gotten uh, more attention than my average um, research papers. Um, and I included them as optional readings for you. One is about how provisions um, in US legislation that effectively boycotted minerals from Central Africa um, that uh, Maybe, maybe used to fund um, armed groups, rebel groups. Um, the paper is about how that has made things worse in parts of Africa rather than better. So it's caused more violence rather than less. Um, and it's caused higher rates of infant mortality. And so it's a, about a particular policy and about adverse unintended effects of that policy that include bloodshed and infant mortality and explosive topics. So, you know, can you, can you write about these topics in an objective way and still get the word out there? Um, it has got a lot of attention. Um, the, the second paper is about an empirical paper, and it's about how the spread of wolves um, has led to a reduction in deaths. It's re, uh, a, reduction in human deaths. Why? Because the spread of wolves has reduced deer vehicle collisions that, you know, that kill and injure a lot of people and certainly damage a lot of property. Why, why has the spread of wolves done that? Well, we think for two reasons. One, wolves reduce overabundant deer populations that are a hazard on roads. But more interestingly, we think it's because the presence of wolves causes deers, deer causes deer to shift their travel, um, their travel patterns in a way that pushes them away from roads, so it has this behavioral impact. And this might have policy implications when we think about um, uh, predator conservation and the application of the Endangered Species Act, because it shows, as we're learning in other cases, that large apex predators can have these indirect effects on economic and ecological systems that can have uh, economic value, okay? Um, so these are a couple papers that got a lot of attention. They were, um, they, they were, they were pretty explosive. Um, and so, uh, you know, I wondered, 
you know, is part of the reason the papers got of attention is because I drifted from an objective stance uh, with my co-authors. So we ran the abstracts through our system, and this one um, scored very uh, low on subjectivity. So this is this is deemed by our program to be an objective um, abstract. There's pressure after the publication of the paper to say, um, I don't know, subjective things about what it means for policy. So when I was uh, when I was contacted by media and um, politicians, uh, you know, they they wanted to press me to say more than I felt like the research could say on this topic. But prior to publication, there was very little pressure to word things in any special way, um, which I was grateful for. Um, the the <coughs> other abstract, uh, there was a bit more pressure. This is in a science journal. There was a bit more pressure to be sensational about the portrayal of the issue. Um, wolves are a hot topic issue. They're very controversial. Um, and, and so there, there, was, there was pressure. This paper is, this abstract is deemed to be more subjective than the other one, but still pretty low on the subjectivity scale. Um, so two papers that, ha that were written in, I think, a pretty objective way that have delivered policy relevance and that have also got a lot of attention, so it shows it can be done. After this paper was published, there was certainly a lot of pressure from two sides. There was pressure from wolf advocacy groups to say a lot more than the research said that this means wolves should be everywhere, you know. Um, but there is also um, pressure on the other side, so we want to do more research about how do wolves affect agricultural systems. They prey on livestock, but they also prey on uh, coyotes and foxes. What, what's, the, what's the full effect of wolves on livestock operations? They prey on deer and deer eat crop. There's all these things we want to learn. And the US Department of Agriculture uh, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service is very reluctant to share any data with us because, you know, oh wow, what are you going to find? What are you going to say? So there, there's pressures and restrictions on what academics can do. And we're, we're, we're certainly part of the problem. But there's other forces at work that, that uh, make data not available. So a big related problem, um, and one we haven't found a way to study empirically, is errors of omission. So you know, I, we're, we're talking about language use in papers that are published and projects people chose to work on. How many environmental studies are just simply not being conducted because of these pressures to get published and to get tenure? So here's one story that um, I think is worth looking into on your own time. Um, and it's about an author of a paper that got published in Nature. And um, there was a bunch of junior authors on it. Nature's a big hit. It's going to help them get tenure. Um, and after the paper was published, one of the authors wrote this expose about what he thinks they did to make sure the paper got published. And what he thinks they did was leave out the truth about um, parts of their paper. And so the paper was about um, uh, changes in wildfire incidents over time and their prevalence. And what he said that they did in his expose is they overemphasized climate and its impact and left out all these other determinants of changing wildfires, which is you know, political management, bureaucratic inertia, uh, things that have prevented wildfire prevention um, in the past. He said they left that out just to make sure the paper would get published. The emphasis on, on climate was the route to do that. So there's, there, there, there's surely lots of errors of omission. Um, and, you, and you get this statement where, again, I'm circling back to this being the policy boot camp. Um, and so, so, so some, some of what's going on here is, I think, articulated well in Robert Lackey's paper, which I also um, gave as a reading. Um, and he's very concerned about the influence of normative science. 
so prescriptions about policy. He said, normative science often is not perceptibly normative to policymakers and even to many scientists. The use of such science by scientists, however, is a stealth policy advocacy, even if its use is not intentional. I, I like that paper. Um, and he wrote it in 2007 based on a, a, a career of observing what scientists, in his case, it was in ecology, had been advising policymakers to do. Okay, let me summarize. So I think we, I feel confident making these, these statements. So academic norms of ob objectivity on topics of the environment differ from other norms in other areas of science, social science and uh, hard science. Um, economics, or I'm sorry, uh, environmental topics are sometimes treated more like religion than science. Um, yet there's strong incentives to follow these norms. We talked about it. Um, you know, you, you, you need, to, need to publish as an academic um, and you want friends in the academy. Uh, the bigger problem for science in this area is that following norms puts credibility at risk. So we have a bit of a prisoner's dilemma. Um, we could all be better off as a discipline if we had stricter norms of objectivity but breaking them individually is risky. Um, and I think these norms are likely a contributor to pessimism broadly about the environment, alarmism. And if we have populations that are pessimistic and alarmist about the environment in a democracy, they're going to push pressure on politicians to make policy. So if we have policy that's based on pessimism and alarmist, alarmism, and part of that pessimism comes from subjective science, then, then we have a real societal problem. Uh, so what do we do? <laughs> uh, I mean, on the surface, we need to reward scientists and economists for objectively quantifying trade-offs, costs and benefits of policies, potential policies. Um, in economics, everything has, everything has a trade-off, everything has a cost. Some policies deliver big benefits. The Clean Air Act uh, did so. It, it, it cleaned air and um, uh, that reduced human mortality uh, enormously. Um, but we wouldn't know that if we didn't do the analysis, if we didn't do costs and benefits and quantify trade-offs. Um, Policies towards climate abatement and mitigation, you know, some of them have much more questionable um, benefits and, and pretty enormous costs. So those are resources that society could otherwise devote to other important problems. Um, and we don't know that if we don't do the objective analysis. If we're scared to do it or we're otherwise incentivized to stay away, uh, we're doing society a big disservice. Um, so. The other thing more pragmatically is I think this is demonstrating that we can build tools, language models, for example, that can highlight non-falsifiable claims, that can highlight and find this language in papers and flag it. Maybe that's a tool that editors would want to use. Um, it's certainly a tool that one could use um, to audit what's going on in the scientific discipline way easier than it had been before. I mean, that's what enabled this study that I've described. So let me be clear um, that there is a role, in my mind, uh, in literature, in art, in daily conversation, in daily life for subjectivity and normative expression. In and of itself is not a, not a bad thing. This gives us the flavor of life, the depth of discussion. Um, we just can't use this kind of language under the guise of science. It's, um, it's misleading and irresponsible. So that is what I wanted to talk with you about. Um, and I'm happy to uh, hear your feedback and uh, answer any questions or try to.